Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 455th episode, we have a bunch of news, including two new dinosaurs. And we also have a listener question about what the fastest dinosaur was, which was way more work than I thought it was going to be. I went down all sorts of different possibilities and like biomechanical studies of different animals to try to piece together which one might have been the fastest. And I've got what I think is a good answer, but you can be the judge of it after I've done explaining myself. It's a tough question to answer. It is very difficult since we can't watch them and get a stopwatch out. And then we've got dinosaur of the day, sign ornithomimus. And the reason why will become clear after our fastest dinosaur. Hint, hint. <laughs> and of course, I've got a fun fact, which is about some weirdness about early dinosaur names. But before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep our podcast running. And I should be thanking new patrons because some new patrons joined who deserve a shout out. But the COVID, I just tested negative for the first day in 17 days today. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> We're all happy about that. But that is my roundabout way of saying making an excuse for not thanking the new patrons, but I will thank them next week and thank you to all of you who joined. But our 10 existing patrons who we're going to thank this week are Seamus B, Steven Raptor Lorenzo, Ankylosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Reggie, Jurassic Jim, Ray, Abigail, Brosis Girl, and Xenorama. Excellent. Thank you so much for being a dino at all and being part of our community. It helps us keep this podcast going and especially helps us when we have to take a week off for being sick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just the financial as well as the moral support. We got a lot of nice messages. So thank you to everybody for yes. the well wishes. That was really nice to read. So jumping into the news, I'm starting. I don't know why. Oh, yeah, I'm surprised. You know, my dinosaur is pretty cool. My, I think mine's pretty cool, too. But <laughs> <laughs> should do like a poll for who's is better and who should have started. <laughs> but my new Iguanodontian dinosaur was written up by Sergio Sanchez Fenoyosa and others and published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. It's got one of the funniest names that I've seen on a dinosaur. It's Obletosaurus bunueli. And Obletosaurus means obsolete lizard. <laughs> because it's extinct? <laughs> there, are, there are several reasons, but it's the same Obleto that you get in Nomen Obletum. We've talked about some dinosaur names become basically obsolete. Mm -hmm. So one example is Scrotum Humanum is considered a Nomen Obletum. That is just like uh, nobody would use that anymore. It's totally useless. Are they expecting <laughs> this dinosaur name to go away? <laughs> I don't think so. So they gave a couple reasons. Obletus can also mean forgotten. So that could refer to the fact that Obletosaurus, of all the fossils in the area where it was dug up, these were the last fossils to be dug up. Mm, okay. The largest sauropod from Europe, Turiosaurus, and the Stegosaurus docentrurus were both from that same spot and stole the thunder of Obletosaurus. No. Oh. So in a way, Obletosaurus was like the forgotten one of that set of three. Because, yeah, if you see hadrosaur bones, a lot of times people are like, it's a hadrosaur. It's <laughs> probably not as interesting as a stegosaur, which are really rare, or this huge bone from you know what turned out to be the largest sauropod from europe yeah well yeah can't beat the sauropods it's tough to compete with for sure but eventually they did get around to taking up these bones and found out they were something special so it did deserve a new genus and species name and that name is obletosaurus bunyeli i think if i had to choose two i'd rather be considered forgotten than obsolete but neither is really great for a dinosaur name which is why i think it's so funny the species name, Buñueli, honors Spanish filmmaker Luis Buñuel, who was born in 1900 in the province Teruel, which is where Obletosaurus was found. I definitely need to watch some of Buñuel's films. He was hugely influential in the early 20th century in cinema in general, but he was also close friends with Salvador Dali and made some really crazy sounding surrealist stuff. 
Oh, yeah, that'd be interesting to watch. Yeah, actually, Dolly, I think, is in one of the films for a little while because they were, you know, Mm -hmm. as happens when you're a a struggling early filmmaker, you get your friends involved with it because you don't have to pay them (laughs) 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 or just because you want to work with them. But yeah, so some of these films sound really interesting. He's one of the historical greats in the movie Midnight in Paris. If you've seen that, it's sort of a collection of these early 20th century artists. And the genus name, Oblitosaurus, could also refer to one of his films, Los Ovidados, which is Spanish for the Forgotten Ones. Okay. That's a nicer connection. It is a much nicer connection. I was thinking that they balanced each other out, obsolete, and then this really famous (laughs) person's for the species name. That's true. Yeah, that would work too. They also created a movie poster style announcement of the discovery that says Buñuel's The Forgotten Lizard. (laughs) And it's in like the style of an old, you know, like early 20th century movie poster. And it's all in Spanish. It's just, it's really cool. I like how much they leaned into this idea. Mm -hmm. One of the co-authors said the dinosaur name, quote, promotes the dissemination of the cinematographic heritage of Spain and Mexico Undoubtedly, this publication is the best way to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Teruel Dinopolis Paleontological Joint Foundation and to honor Luis Buñuel on the 40th anniversary of his death, end quote. So they came up with all sorts of connections. Uh, Yeah, they put a lot of thought into this. They really did. It's very cool. So among the fossils that they had, they found a tooth, a thumb spike, and a nearly complete leg. The thumb spikes are exciting. They are very exciting, yes, because as an iguanodontian, they have those big spikes for thumbs, which are really unusual for dinosaurs. And since this one is from the end of the Jurassic, about 150 million years ago, that thumb spike is something you see in more of the later dinosaurs. So it's cool to see it in such an early dinosaur. The tooth and the thumb spike were found back in 2005. The leg wasn't unfound until 2009, and it was about 12 meters or 40 feet away and was partially articulated. So I'm kind of wondering if they found that thumb spike and a tooth, and they're like, okay, let's move on and work out the sauropod and the stegosaur. Forget about this one. Yeah. And then they found the leg, and they're like, oh, that's actually a pretty good good find. (laughs) Oblitosaurus is the largest known ornithopod from the late Jurassic in all of Europe, and one of the largest in the world at the time. That's pretty good. Yeah, so you've got the largest sauropod from Europe Mm -hmm. found with the largest ornithopod from Europe in the same spot, which is pretty cool. What made these dinosaurs so large? I don't know. (laughs) It was estimated to be between 6 to 7 meters or 20 to 23 feet long, which really doesn't sound that big, but it is about twice as long as the close European relative Draconix. So... Comparing it to its contemporaries, especially the contemporaries in the same space, it was really big. But there were certainly much larger ornithopods in the late Cretaceous. It also makes Oblitosaurus about as big or maybe a little bit bigger than the largest Camptosaurus individuals, which were in the U.S. I think it's quite a bit bigger, though, than the holotype. So I think that's why in a lot of the press materials, it's like it was the biggest in Europe and in contention for the biggest in the world, I think Camptosaurus might be the one that's competing with it. Oblitosaurus was found in northeast Spain in the Villar del Arzobispo formation. It's possible that some large tracks from nearby were from Oblitosaurus. The tracks are about 30 centimeters or one foot long, which matches the size of the Oblitosaurus foot pretty closely because, again, they got that articulated leg, which includes a foot. Oblitosaurus is also tied for the basal most or oldest in evolutionary terms of all of the Ankyloplexians. And Ankyloplexia basically means stiff thumb and refers to that weird thumb spike. So it's cool to see that such an early one also had this thumb spike. Mm -hmm. And it includes Inguanodontians, Hadrosaurids, and all of the big bipedal plant eating relatives that you find basically ubiquitous in the Cretaceous especially, but they were around in the late Jurassic. So it's really, it's always great to see these early examples because they give you a lot more idea about the family tree, where things started out before they got all crazy in the Cretaceous. Yeah. 
and the discovery of Oblitosaurus also helped clear up some of the Iguanodontian family tree in general. Oh, nice. The author's analysis put all three species of Camptosaurus in one group together, and some other recent analyses had split them out into different parts of the family tree, so it was unclear. There have been proposals to change the genus name of a couple of these species because you don't want to have the same genus <laughs> in, in multiple places. That's very confusing. So then you have to get different genus if they're going to be in different parts of the family tree. But it might be okay having them all in Camptosaurus if this turns out to be correct. So it turned out to be a pretty important find. It did. Even though it was forgotten, I wouldn't consider it obsolete. No, if anything, it brought a lot of new information to light. Far from obsolete. Good for you, Oblitosaurus. <laughs> Even though that name literally means obsolete. So I was going to say that I had you beat because my ceratopsid fills in a lot of gaps about ceratopsid, but then you just said that Oblitosaurus uh, filled in some gaps. So, hmm. Might have to uh, let the listeners break that tie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get into all those details in a moment, but first we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. So yes, there is a new centrosaurine ceratopsid. Like I said, it fills in a lot of gaps about ceratopsids, specifically what their bodies looked like, which is cool because usually we know more way more about the skulls yeah yeah you're just tripping over horns and frill chunks all over the place but not a lot of body parts it must have been very tasty <laughs> yeah right it, that's true this one is named forcatoceratops elucidens and it was published in cretaceous research by hiroki ishikawa and others it lived in in the late Cretaceous, in what is now Montana in the U.S., it was found in the Judith River Formation, and it lived about 76 to 75 million years ago. A lot of Ceratopsians have been found in the Judith River Formation, but most of the skeletons are very fragmentary. But not in this case. In this case, they found a nearly complete skeleton. It was excavated and prepared by Tribal Paleontology, Inc., and they also found, well, they did also find fragments of hadrosaur limbs, so... There you go. I got some hadrosaurs in, in my story. <laughs> some hadrosaur in my ceratops again. <laughs> now, Forcatoceratops had some unique features in the horns and the nasal. The holotype they found was disarticulated, meaning it wasn't as it was in life. All mixed around. Yeah, the bones were a little mixed up, but it includes part of the frill, beak, horns, a lot of the skull, most of the middle of the body, like the ribs, vertebrae, pelvis, shoulder, etc., a lot of the tail, and bones from three out of four legs. Hey, three out of four is not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mostly thinking that whole middle section of the body is, is what's pretty great. The bulk of it. Yeah, the bulky body. Uh, the left side was more complete than the right side. It looked somewhat similar to Nasutoceratops. And it's closely related to Nasutoceratops, so that makes sense. It walked on all fours. It didn't have that nose horn. It also had that bulky body. But it had a short frill and two short brow horns that pointed straight ahead. And then it had a rounded snout. When you say straight ahead, does that mean they were pointed like in front of it or that they weren't curved at all? Like they were perfectly straight? I think it was in front and forward facing. And not curved. They're almost too short to be curved. Oh, I see. At least without the keratin. Maybe they looked more impressive and longer with the keratin horn coverings when it was alive. You could say that about <laughs> any dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking more so for these ones where I was like, oh, it's it just had, you know, small horns, not a big deal. Oh, I mean, they're still large. They're just not as large as other Not meter long. Yeah. Now, its nasal is similar to Nasutoceratops. It's got a low bump, but it's unclear if it had a horn on its nose. The paleo art doesn't show any nose horns. Again, we get, we don't know about the keratin. Yeah, but if there's no uh, bone there, really, it's kind of oh, rounded. That's true, yeah, because some of them actually have a bony horn mm -hmm. in addition. The jugal, or the cheek, is broad and flat, and it had small and blunt epijugals, so armored cheek plates. 
and there were epiosifications around the frill, so some bony extensions of the frill. The lower jaw had 30 teeth, and the teeth in the very front and very back were smaller than the other teeth and, quote, apparently had not completely erupted by the time of death, end quote. It also had long ungules, or hooves, as seen in other young ceratopsids, which maybe you've guessed by now, this was a younger one. It was a subadult. Ah, uh, that could explain some of these smaller horns, too. It could be. They did histology on it, so that's how they know. They found two lags, the lines of arrested <laughs> growth, so it's probably two to three years old when it died. Yeah, that's small. Yeah. Or young, I should say. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that small. Maybe it was small for a dinosaur. I don't know. Eh, maybe not. <laughs> Actually, no. It was moderately sized because it was about 10 feet or 3 meters long and 5 feet or 1.5 meters tall, according to the skeletal reconstruction figure in the paper. That's pretty good. It takes humans a lot longer than two to three years to reach five feet tall. Yes. And we never reach 10 feet long. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were also a lot of bones that weren't fully fused. So again, subadult. And that's important because juvenile or subadult ceratopsian skeletons of early diverging centrosaurines like this one are relatively scarce. Hmm. So this helps show more about how ceratopsids grew. It's that ontogenetic variation. Yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword because sometimes you find a juvenile, like in this case, and they name it a new genus and you think like, well, it could be just on its way to changing to look like something we already know about as an adult. Mm. But on the other hand, if you don't have the juveniles then you can't figure out how they change mm -hmm. and you'll never put those pieces together. So you, you do need both. It just depends on the situation, whether you'd rather get a juvenile or an adult. Since they're classifying this as a sub-adult, I think it's more on its way towards adulthood yeah. than juvenile. Yeah, it's always hard. Different people use different terminology, but I, at two to three years, I think you could still call it a juvenile, or a lot of people might. Mm. So going back to yeah, being about 10 feet or three meters long, its body size is comparable to relatively large adult-sized centrosaurines. But like we were saying, being a subadult, its body size doesn't necessarily mean it was mature. The authors, they talked about how on some adult-sized centrosaurines, the surface texture of their bones were different, just not mature. And that may mean that it's more useful to look at bone surface textures to figure out if a centrosaurian is a juvenile, subadult, or adult, instead of looking at its body size and figuring how close it was to being an adult. The genus name for Catoceratops means fork-like, and that refers to the horns looking like a two-pronged fork. <laughs> <laughs> and the species name, Elucidens, means elucidate, it's enlightening, and it refers to how, quote, the holotype can provide much insight to ceratopsid osteology, including often overlooked elements due to the superb and disarticulated mode of preservation of most bones, end quote. There you go. So, sort of the exact opposite of a bleedosaurus. Mm. <laughs> Elucidens. It's like, this is a very important one that elucidates things versus, we forgot about this one. Yes. <laughs> or it's obsolete. <laughs> At least when it comes to the name. Yeah. <laughs> now, again, a lot of ceratopsids have been found in the Judith River Formation, and that includes Medusa ceratops, Judas ceratops, Mercurius ceratops, Spiclipius, and more. Not all of them have been named. But again, they're fairly fragmentary. So this relatively complete ceratops, it helps a lot. Yeah, and you got to say Spiclipius, which is one of my favorite dinosaur names. <laughs> Did you just point that out so you could say Spiclipius? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place, they also include Tyrannosaurs like Displetosaurus, Ankylosaurs like Zool, Hadrosaurs, and lots of other ceratopsians. I noticed you didn't name any hadrosaurs. Everyone's always forgetting about the hadrosaurs. Not forgetting. Well, other animals that lived around the same time and place, they included frogs, fish, crocodilians, lizards, and turtles. <laughs> I'm always hesitant to bring up the turtles. <laughs> they always come up. They do. I guess it's, it's relevant because it tells you a lot about the ecosystem because we know today the kind of places that turtles live in. But I think they also fossilize pretty well. That carapace is sort of like the ceratopsian head, but it has the added advantage of being in water and usually sh shallow water too. So a good chance of fossilization. 
So now on to our patron question, which came from Sue. So thank you very much. They said, NASCAR in Chicago has made me curious. What is the fastest dinosaur? And if you could do fastest dinosaur as a future dinosaur of the day, in episode 221, you mentioned Dromesiomimus as one of the fastest. And I was wondering if it still is the fastest. Please let me know, <laughs> which is a great question. I did not even remember that Sabrina mentioned Dromesiomimus potentially being the fastest dinosaur in episode 221. So I had to go back. It was a few years ago. Yeah. And dig into that a little bit. And I'm not even sure if I'm saying Dromesiomimus quite right because it's spelled a little bit different than most of the ornithomimids because it has an extra E in it. So mm. I'm going with Dromesiomimus because it's easy to say, but it might be something more like Dromecaeomimus if you're going to be a little more Latin about it. So first I was looking at Dromesiomimus and then I realized a better way to start would be looking at what the fastest running animal body type is, period. Oh, that's a good starting point. Yeah, because then we can sort of figure out like, well, are there any dinosaurs that sort of resemble what we know as like sort of the optimal fast running body type? Mm -hmm. And in short, all of the fastest running animals today are quadrupedal. Cheetah came to mind when you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, there's cheetahs, there's greyhounds, there's all sorts of animals, horses, if you're picturing something running really fast, it's probably quadrupedal. And there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is that it allows more contact time with the ground, which is a more efficient way for generating force in general. So for example, if you are thinking about climbing three stairs, you could walk up them and sort of slowly press on each step, or you could squat down and try to hop up all three at once. <laughs> and if you were gonna climb a lot of stairs, you'd be better off slowly pressing at each step than trying to hop up each one where you're having to exert a lot of force with less contact time than if you can sort of gradually press. And there are thermodynamic calculations for this too where like if you go infinitely slow, that's the most efficient way to get force going. But that's enough of that. Quadrupeds also have this advantage where they can flex their spine while they gallop and they use all of their back muscles in addition to their arm and leg muscles to propel them forwards. Mm. It's really cool. I watch a lot of slow motion cheetahs and other galloping animals mm -hmm. and the way that they use their back is just amazing. Bipedal animals, on the other hand, have to use rigid spines so that we can stay balanced on just two lengths. Mm -hmm. If we had nimbly bimbly spines, you know, our head would just be like falling over to the side. <laughs> you have to have a stiff spine to stay in the upright posture. Or in the case of dinosaurs, like a T-Rex, where it's sort of legs are in the middle point and it's kind of like a teeter-totter with the head out front and the tail out back. Mm -hmm. If that spine was all loosey-goosey, the head and the tail are going to fall down. Ooh. And then it's you either end up with the weird kangaroo dinosaur or like those really early depictions of something like a uh, stegosaurus where it's like this weird half circle shape because mm. it's just like too limp to hold itself up. And obviously you're not going to be able to run fast if you're just <laughs> flopping all over. Yep. When I think fast, I don't think floppy. Nope. When we're talking about dinosaurs though, we haven't found any quadrupedal dinosaurs that are built for high speed. The closest might be big hadrosaurs that were at least partially quadrupedal. At least that was the one I could think of. Can you think of any other quadrupedal dinosaurs that look like they might have been quick? Huh, quadrupedal. No, I always think of them as slow moving. Yeah. I think the reason is that most of the quadrupeds traded being huge for being fast. Mm -hmm. They just, for whatever reason, it was like a lot of these animals, they, we know they started out as bipedal and meat eating and a lot of the ones that went into eating plants got quadrupedal and got slow we didn't see anything develop into something that looked like a galloping animal at all none of them have the right leg lengths or the right proportions or the right flexibility of the back that you look for when you're looking for a galloping quadrupedal animal mm -hmm. it would be really cool though it's, it's not impossible that we could find something like that someday that's what I love about dinosaurs. There's always a possibility. Yes. As a, a weird fun fact side that I didn't want to use as an actual fun fact because it was just too weird. 
There are humans that run quadrupedally. Really? Yeah, the world record I saw for a 100-meter dash quadrupedally is something like 15 and a half seconds, and the world record for bipedally is it's in the nines. Huh. So it's not that much slower. Basically, it's the same sort of strategy that galloping animals use. Mm -hmm. You do like left hand down, right hand down, right leg down, left leg down. Mm -hmm. It's sort of in a circle. It's <laughs> how galloping animals go, you know, like the sort of rotating in a circle. And that's how quadrupedal humans, I think they're just doing it for fun, basically. Yeah. Do it, but they get up to a decent speed. It's just the problem is our shoulders and our proportions aren't in the right orientation for really using our arms for locomotion mm -hmm. plus like i said our back is way too stiff so it doesn't really help we end up in this sort of like weird v shape <laughs> rather than a nice galloping like curved shape but anyway back to dinosaurs since there aren't any really fast quadrupedal dinosaurs we're basically left with finding the fastest bipedal dinosaur and i will say dromesia mimus is definitely a contender for the fastest dinosaur it would be fitting, since the species name means emu mimic, the scientific name for emu is Dromeceus or Dromaceus. At least it was at one point, it sort of got changed later. But emus are some of the fastest birds. According to the Audubon Society, emus are the second fastest running birds at 50 kilometers an hour or 31 miles an hour. Wow. Although ostriches are quite a bit faster, they run about 70 kilometers an hour, 43 miles an hour, which isn't as fast as the fastest quadrupedal animals, but it's not that far off. It's very impressive for a bipedal animal for sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, ostriches can maintain the emu's top speed continuously for miles. Impressive. One place I looked said they could do it for about 30 minutes, which would cover about a marathon a little <laughs> bit less than a marathon <laughs> at like 30 miles an hour it's pretty crazy some sources do say that rias are slightly faster than emus by about five to ten kilometers an hour or three to six miles an hour which would make the emu the third fastest living running dinosaur and that's pretty cool too because ostriches obviously are huge Emus are a little bit smaller, but rias are actually quite a bit smaller still than emu. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that rias could be faster. It's not as simple as just the longest legs, the biggest bird oh, yeah. runs the fastest. Well, I was thinking with rias that they're small or because they're smaller, they're lighter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then that doesn't explain because they're still smaller than ostriches that yeah. are faster. It's a very complicated, it depends on the length of the leg, the ratio of leg bones, the musculature, the flexibility. There's a lot of factors in it. And it, even things as detailed as like how much fast twitch versus slow twitch muscle fibers they have and elasticity and tendons and stuff that it gets really complicated and it all interacts together for a combination of which ones are built for fast bursts of speed versus long distance running or combinations. That makes me think it's hard to know which dinosaur because we don't know that much about the specific muscles. It is very hard, yes. <laughs> also, for the record, the fastest running birds that can fly are roadrunners at about 33 kilometers an hour or 21 miles an hour, which is slower than actually a lot of human sprinters. So in all those cartoons where the roadrunners, you know, running like crazy, it can't really fly. It can fly and it doesn't actually run that fast compared to a lot of other birds <laughs> and certainly not quadrupedal animals. Coyote could easily chase it down. Coyote gets loaded down by all its, his Acme products. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> the most likely candidates for the fastest running dinosaurs, I would say, are ornithomimids. I believe I've seen other paleontologists throw this out there as a, a likely answer too. That includes Gallimimus, Ornithomimus, Struthiomimus, and Dromesiomimus, some of the Ornithomimids. Mm -hmm. Some people have suggested lumping species of Ornithomimus and Struthiomimus with Dromesiomimus because they have a lot in common. In general, they all look a lot like ostriches, again, the fastest living dinosaurs. So that's a good clue. It is. But again, just because they look similar doesn't necessarily mean that they behaved similar. Mm -hmm. Ornithomimids get their fast speed, or presumably got their fast speed, because they're lightly built, they have long legs, and also long foot bones, and they seem like they were probably pretty covered in muscle, which is also an important detail with how fast you can run. Mm -hmm. 
along with tyrannosaurids and troodontids that had specialized feet with pinched together foot bones that would have helped them run quickly. Oh, interesting, with tyrannosaurids and troodontids too. Yeah, so that's that arctometatarsalian, arctometatarsalian foot. I know you bring that up sometimes in your dinosaurs of the day of like some of the unique features. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the reasons too that people say maybe it was juvenile T-Rex that was the fastest dinosaur. But as adults, they were definitely way too heavy to be contenders for the fastest dinosaurs. There's no way that a nine ton animal is going to be outrunning <laughs> everything else. It's just, it's too much mass to get up to speed. Their heads alone were too heavy. Yeah. We covered a paper a little while back and it, it was showing that with living animals, as they get heavier, which is in their study, it was around a about 100 kilograms or 200 pounds once they pass that point it became hard for the animals to accelerate to their top speed without running out of easily accessible energy in Mm -hmm. their body and obviously an adult t-rex is a couple orders of magnitude heavier than that so it would have just been way too heavy to reach its highest speeds there are other studies that just look at sort of the length and the musculature and have said like oh they could run 45 miles an hour or something like that But I think when you're a little more realistic about the amount of energy that it takes to get such a heavy body up to that speed, it's really unlikely that they had a metabolism that could really back that up. Mm. But there is a lot of variability. Although I would say a safe estimate for the fastest dinosaur is that it was very likely between 10 kilograms and 1,000 kilograms, or about 20 pounds to one ton. (laughs) That's a That's a lot of variability, too. It is, but it kind of narrows down when you're thinking about all the different dinosaurs that are out there, the sort of subset that you could be thinking of that might have been the fastest dinosaurs. Troodontids are also contenders, like I was saying, with their fancy feet, but we don't have nearly as many fossils to work with as we do with ornithomimids, and a lot of them are really small, so their stride length would have been a pretty limiting factor. Mm -hmm. They could go fast for their size. Yes. So I'm just going to focus on ornithomimids. doesn't necessarily mean that they were the fastest dinosaurs, but I think they're the best known dinosaurs that we have a good idea about them being fast. One possible method to figure out which ornithomimids were the fastest is to look at their leg bone lengths. So very simply, a bigger tibia to femur ratio is sometimes an advantage for sprinting speed. It's a biomechanical thing. It basically just gives you a better leverage Mm -hmm. on running. So in other words, a longer lower leg and a shorter upper leg is what we're looking for. There was a 2020 study by Daichi Tomita and others that found that human sprinters with a higher tibia to femur ratio were faster in 400 meter races. Oh, wow. Than those with, you know, longer femur to tibia ratios. Mm -hmm. They didn't find a difference, though, for 100 meter sprinters in this study. There were other studies that have seen it, but it's it's not super consistent mm-hmm. because, again, there are a lot of other factors. Including the distance. Yeah. One of the defining characteristics of Dermesiomimus is that it had a different tibia to femur ratio than Gallimimus, Ornithomimus, and Struthiomimus, which is pretty interesting when you're thinking about was it a faster sprinter. Yeah. A study by Ian McDonald and Phil Curry back in 2018 looked at several individuals to compare the leg proportions, and they were partly looking at them just to see if they should all be unique genera. You know, are they all their own type of dinosaur, Mm -hmm. or are they too similar? And what they found was that on average, Dromesia mimus had a 11% longer tibia to femur ratio than Gallimimus. Hmm. It was about 8% longer than Ornithomimus and about 6% longer than Struthiomimus. So, yes, they deserve to be separate genera. Yeah, that was basically their conclusion. But you could also look at it and say if the only factor you're looking at is that tibia to femur ratio, that you would expect Dromesiomimus to be the fastest, followed by Struthiomimus, then Ornithomimus, and then Gallimimus. Mm -hmm. At least in this four, there are other Ornithomimids, but just of those four, that would be the ranking. Unfortunately, though, it's not that simple in real life when you're comparing between species, especially Mm -hmm. maybe within a species, like I was saying, with just humans, or if you're looking at, say, just cheetahs or just greyhounds or something, then it might work out. But when you're looking between species, there's so many other factors. Yeah, look at ostriches versus rayas. Yeah. Penny Hudson and others in 2011 compared the leg lengths of cheetahs and greyhounds to see how cheetahs are so much faster than greyhounds because they are way faster. (laughs) 
they've found that greyhounds consistently had longer tibia to femur ratios than cheetahs, hmm. which just totally flies in the face of this. They were like 30% longer Ooh. on average, so much longer. But the cheetahs had overall longer legs on their bodies, which obviously helps them to keep their feet in contact with the ground and also to increase the length of their stride and produce more power. Strangely, cheetahs have smaller muscles at their hips than greyhounds, which seems very strange because a lot of the power comes from the hips. Yeah. Presumably, they generate power more from their backs. Like I was saying, how quadrupedal animals can gallop and use their back sort of like a big spring. That flexible back. Yeah. So when they're, when they're jumping forward, they bring their legs up and forward, and then they crunch up their back, basically. And then when their back legs touch the ground kind of in front of them, they can use their back to stretch out like a you know a huge leg press, including <laughs> the back, and you know really f- get that force going behind them. I know this is the wrong analogy, but I'm thinking of a slinky when the way you were describing that. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Or you could think of maybe like a kangaroo or something. Mm-hmm. It's just got that sort of rebounding force to it. Yeah, because slinkies are too floppy. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Although the floppiness is a feature a little bit, the flexibility. Mm. So with bipedal dinosaurs, maybe their tail musculature might have had a similar impact to the back musculature in something like a cheetah or a greyhound. Like we've talked about the caudofemoralis helping to lift the leg muscles. So maybe that could give us a clue. Mm -hmm. But other than the overall limb length, most of those features don't directly fossilize and they have to be modeled or assumed based on similar animals. If we go by overall limb size, Gallimimus is a strong contender for the fastest since it was especially tall. It's the largest known ornithomimid, known from more than just a bone or two. And at the hips, it was around 1.9 meters or over six feet tall. Oh, I'm just thinking about that scene in Jurassic Park and yeah, how close they got to that flock of the stampede. Stampeding, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gallimimus, that would be terrifying. And they were scared of the movie. Mm hmm. Yeah, so Gallimimus had legs that were quite a bit longer than an ostrich. So if you're just thinking about stride length, you'd think, oh, okay, maybe it could be as fast or faster than an ostrich. But we don't know its exact stride length since fossilized running tracks are so rare and we don't know the sort of flexibility of its legs and how far out it could stretch them. We also don't know how fast it could swing its legs. Cheetahs can swing their legs quite a bit faster than greyhounds, for example. So even at the same stride length, they can move faster because they're, you know, their feet are just moving faster. So if you're doing the same stride length, but you're doing it twice as often, you go twice as fast, basically. Hmm. Counting against Gallimimus, a large Gallimimus weighed about half a ton, which might have slowed it down compared to some of the smaller ornithomimids, depending on its metabolism. So given the similarities between the fastest birds today and ornithomimids, I think they're our best guess. Probably one of them that's close to 100 kilograms, like Ornithomimus, Struthiomimus, or Dromesiomimus. But Gallimimus is probably a little bit too heavy, although still a possibility. And I think since Dromesiomimus had that biggest tibia to femur ratio, you know, it's, it's definitely a contender. It could be the fastest dinosaur. Yeah. I don't know that we'll ever know for sure the answer to this question. We won't ever know for sure. We might eventually be like, fairly confident Mm -hmm. (laughs) but yeah well you can never know these types of things for sure so thank you sue for the question sent me down quite a few different (laughs) types of research rabbit holes so uh, i appreciate it a lot of interesting side facts that you found there yeah and if anybody else has a question feel free to shoot it to us on patreon or in discord or something like that yeah We'll get into even more ornithomimosaurs in a moment with our dinosaur of the day. But first, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, sign Ornithomimus, which I'm going to say is a request from Sue via our Patreon Discord. But technically, the request was for the fastest dinosaur. <laughs> Continuation. Yes. <laughs> And like we were just talking about the fastest dinosaurs, we're thinking are ornithomimosaurs. We have covered a lot of ornithomimosaurs as our dinosaurs of the day for this show. So I had to find a new one. But based on, Garrett, what you just said about 
that it was probably one that was close to 100 kilograms. This one works because it was estimated to weigh about 201 pounds or 91 kilograms. Yeah. Yeah, definitely another contender for fastest dinosaur. Yeah. There's a 2015 paper by James Farlow and others on theropod locomotion, and they said that cursorality running is something we're not sure what it is, but we think we know it when we see it. <laughs> <laughs> like that, an animal that looks like it could run fast, in other words. Yeah. So again, it's hard to know exactly how fast dinosaurs could run. And there were some fun facts I found about sign ornithomimus, so here we go. It was an ornithomimid, again, that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region in China, and found in the Uwansuhe Formation, and it lived about 90 million years ago. It looked somewhat ostrich-like, but with a shorter neck and a longer head and longer tail. And again, those ornithomimids... They had the toothless jaws with the beaks and the long necks and the long arms and legs. But this one had a relatively short neck and head for an ornithomimosaur. It's estimated to be 8.2 feet or about two and a half meters long and again way at that pretty sweet spot, almost 100 kilograms, 91 kilograms or 201 pounds. And it had slender arms. The type species is Cyanornithomimus dongai. It was described in 2003 by Yoshitsugu Kobayashi and Lu Junchang. The genus name means Chinese bird mimic, and the species name is in honor of Jiming Dong, who found the fossils. What's really cool about this one is that it's the most completely known ornithomimid. Oh, really? That is really cool. Mm-hmm. At least 25 individuals have been found, ranging in age from 1 to 7. Oh, wow. The fossils were first excavated in 1997 as part of the Mongol Highland International Dinosaur Project. The fossils were actually first spotted in 1978. It was found in a bone bed of at least 14 skeletons, and each one of those skeletons had gastroliths. There were three subadults to adults and 11 juveniles. Nine were nearly complete and mostly uncrushed. And the holotype they chose for Cyanornithomimus is a subadult. Now, in that first expedition, they ran out of time, but they managed to collect multiple skeletons. And then in 2001, there was a second expedition that found even more skeletons. So that's how we got up to 25. <laughs> that's so many. Especially a lot of ornithomimids we just know from like a, a few foot bones or, you know, a leg or something. Yeah. Well, not only is it so many, but they're really well preserved because that bone bed has been compared to Pompeii. Hmm. One article said they even knew the size of the dinosaur's eyeballs. I think they were talking about the... Sclerotic ring. Exactly. The little eye bones. <laughs> Those are hard to find. They're very fragile. Yeah. The expedition team had to deal with a lot of dust storms in the Gobi Desert. And the team in the second round had some help digging. They had to treat the area carefully because you want to look at the surroundings to know what happened to the dinosaurs, not just dig out the skeletons, especially when you're in a bone bed. Like, what happened that made this bone bed? And Paul Serino wrote about the experience in 2011 and said toward the end of their expedition, they had a day off and they played a game of basketball at the Chinese Army outpost, and they noticed that they had heavy equipment, so they asked officials at the base if they could help them excavate the dinosaurs. And they had many rounds of Baijiu, and a few days later, the team got a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> the bulldozer removed the hill for them so the team could excavate the last 13 individuals, and they also found the skull of an unknown predator. There was a 2008 paper that studied this graveyard. There's no evidence that the bones moved after the dinosaurs died, and the bones were unweathered, and they were in siltstone and layers of clay, so it's likely that they all died in some sort of catastrophic event. There were some crab-like animals found around them, and that shows the dinosaurs were covered in water shortly after they died, and that's why they're so well-preserved. So they found that they were trapped in mud. Now, modern animals rarely die stuck in mud, so it wasn't clear at first that that's what happened to these dinosaurs. You have to have just the right conditions with low water levels, and those conditions may only last a few days. When the animals are stuck in mud, they usually die from dehydration, starvation, and or predators coming after them. There were some hip bones missing, which might have been from a scavenger eating meat around the hips after they died. 
but there was no signs of weathering or tooth marks. There were no shed theropod teeth found around the skeletons, and the skeletons were mostly facing the same direction. Also, most of the individual's legs were stuck in the mud with their bodies lying flat, hmm. and some of the tails were stuck or plunged in mud. It's a strange situation. Yes, and one skeleton had fallen on top of another. So it's probable that they were walking around looking for water at the edge of a drying lake and then fell into the mud, huh. which is unfortunate. That's weird. Yeah, there's marks in the mud around the skeletons that show that they tried to get out. Oh, I see. And it's really sad because they would have died a slow death stuck in the mud. And then if they're flailing, that would attract predators and eventually scavengers. Like it's stuck in a glue trap. Yeah. And since the this bone bed or graveyard was found with mostly juveniles, there were no adults, there were no hatchlings. It seems that the juveniles spent their time together and then, you know, maybe once they were adults, they would join up with the adults. So even the seven-year-old wasn't considered an adult? I don't think so. It's just really sad when you think about it. Like, oh, it's a group of juveniles that all died together. A slow, painful death. That's a huge downer. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, going back to why they might have been together and, you know, their safety in numbers from predators. And it's possible that the adults focused on nests or brooding. And that's why the juveniles live together. Yeah, there are a lot of animals where the juveniles make their own little groups. Mm -hmm. Cynornithomimus got better at running as it grew up. Adults had relatively longer lower legs. There's your tibia to femur ratio. Yes. <laughs> they took about 10 years to reach maturity. So yeah, going back to what you were saying, seven years old is still a juvenile. The holotype had a 12 and a half inch or 32 centimeter long femur. And as it grew, as Sinornithomimus grew, the ratio of the tibia to femur, the leg bones, increased which, again, like you were saying, it's similar to tyrannosaurids. And going back to that idea of juvenile tyrannosaurs, it does seem that ornithomimids and juvenile tyrannosaurids were similarly good at running. Yeah, for sure. And also, we've talked before about how juvenile tyrannosaurids may have hunted different things than the adults, and part of that could be because the juveniles were faster mm -hmm. and you know not as robust built for taking down big prey. So yeah, maybe they were running quickly, chasing down fast prey when they were little, and then as they got heavier, they couldn't pull it off anymore. Yeah. Switch to a different strategy. Cynornithomimus, though, for the record, wasn't a carnivore because these fossils were found with gastroliths in the stomach area, so it's likely that it was herbivorous or at least more herbivorous than omnivorous. On the herbivorous end of the spectrum. Yes. And as a reminder, gastrolis are the stones that they swallowed to help grind food in their stomachs. The larger individuals had larger gastrolith masses, which makes sense. Now, ornithomimids, though, are often thought to be omnivorous because of their beaks. There was another ornithomimosaur found with what's probably gastroliths. There are pebbles found in the abdomen, and that was Shenjosaurus. It lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now China. So that's more maybe evidence that these types of dinosaurs were more on the herbivorous scale. Not only gastroliths were found, but there was also a thin film of black carbon coating on the sides of the gizzard. So the plants the dinosaur ate. So just more evidence of herbivory. Cynornithomimus lived in an arid to semi-arid environment. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include the theropods Talantisaurus and Xiaochulong the Ankylosaur Gobisaurus, and the Pachycephalosaur Cynocephaly, as well as Iguanodonts. No names for the Iguanodonts. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I thought you might say that. And our fun fact of the day is that some dinosaurs weren't given species names at first. Some dinosaurs haven't been named yet. Sometimes they're known as Iguanodonts or a Hadrosaur. <laughs> <laughs> but these are dinosaurs that were known and were pretty famous. So, <laughs> okay. I would say that genus names are where it's at for dinosaurs. With the exception of T Rex, very few people even know any dinosaur species names. Obviously, with T Rex, Rex is the species, Tyrannosaurus is the genus. Mm -hmm. Velociraptor, for example, is a much cooler name than V. Mongoliensis, mm. I would say. The first named dinosaur genus was Megalosaurus, 
Buckland named it in 1824 without a species name. It ended up working out for him since three years later, Gideon Mantell named it after Buckland when he gave it the species name Bucklandi. He was playing the long game. Yeah, it could be Bucklandii too. But yeah, either way, it's named after Buckland. Of course, Megalosaurus may have been previously called Scrotum Humanum, but that is a nomen obletum. Oh, way to bring that back around. (laughs) Yep. That's the bottom end of a femur that looks like its generic name. Of course, it wasn't ever actually thought to be part of a giant man, even though it often is claimed that that was the case. It was more just described that way because it was like, it kind of looks like, you know, Mm. male genitalia. They thought it came from a giant elephant. Yeah, that was earlier. The bone was lost, so we can't positively ID it as a specific dinosaur genus, but it is very commonly thought to have likely been from a megalosaurus. The second dinosaur ever named was Iguanodon that was also named without a species. This time, Gideon Mantell, the one who added the species name to Megalosaurus, was the one who named Iguanodon without a species. Oh, maybe he was playing the long game. He was hoping someone in a few years would give his name the species name. Maybe. (laughs) Although he named Iguanodon just one year after Buckland named Megalosaurus without a species. So it was before he had added the species name to Iguanodon. He wasn't thinking about it. Maybe. Probably not. Interestingly, he didn't go back and add a species to Iguanodon like he did with Megalosaurus. The first species came after he added that name to Megalosaurus. It was four years after Iguanodon was named and they named it I Anglicus. Or Iguanodon Anglicus. Yes. Three years later, another author named the same fossil I Mantell after Gideon Mantell, but it had already been named Anglicus, Mm. so that one had priority. So he almost got it the same way as William Buckland. Exactly, but just missed it by a few years. It turned out not to really matter, though, because those original teeth are considered a nomen dubium, since they're just teeth and not unique enough to name a new species. And it took over 50 years before a species name actually stuck. That is Iguanodon bernisartensis. That's after the mine where the fantastic finds were found, Bernisart. Mm -hmm. Later, one of those individuals became the type specimen. But don't feel too bad for Gideon Mantell. He eventually got Mantellosaurus named after him. And genus names are better. So he got the genus name. People tend to remember them more than species names. Yes. Nobody calls it M. Bucklandii or... M. atherfieldensis, if you're talking about Mantellosaurus, mm. <laughs> atherfieldensis. Unless you're writing a paper about them. Yeah, sometimes it comes up then. It, sometimes if there's multiple species, it happens more often in the same genus. But since we don't have a good way of telling how closely related dinosaur species are to one another, it's always safer to just give each new dinosaur species its own genus name. That way later on, if it turns out they aren't as closely related as you thought before, and there's another dinosaur that sort of goes in between them with a genus name that isn't mm-hmm. one of those two, then it makes it a lot easier to restructure these family trees without having to rename everything and get all confusing. It also makes it a lot easier to communicate about dinosaurs. For example, when people ask something like, how long was Mementosaurus? Well, the answer is it depends on which species you're talking about. Yeah. Most people want to know about the longest one, but since the type species is a shorter species of Mementosaurus, it can get really confusing really quickly unless you use the species name, but most people don't use the species name. So yeah, it's kind of a mess. It's also more exciting to get a new dinosaur genus than a species of an existing genus. Like I would say the new genus of Bletosaurus is a lot more exciting than if the authors had stuck it in with an existing genus and it was just a new species name and it was something dot Bunyeli. Mm. It sounds like they had to make it a new genus because it was the biggest one. Yeah, it was very different from the other dinosaurs. So definitely deserved its own genus. But I, I'm a big time splitter when it comes to genus names. I think just <laughs> give everything its own genus name. We're way too early still in dinosaur discoveries to be like, oh, these two are definitely very close relatives. There are some exceptions where it's like there's just one feature that's different. But I don't know. I'm all about new genus names. <laughs> but it does need a species. <laughs> you have to have a species. You can't go the Gideon Mantell William Buckland route of just skipping the species. You do need both. Yeah, it's not the 1800s anymore. Nope. (laughs) 
And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, we will be talking about a couple of new sauropods. I'm sure you're excited. I am. If you like this episode, then please share our show with a friend. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.